Is there any drug that cures depression? No. In fact, these drugs change the normal state of the brain, and, and that should worry us about what these drugs might do to people, particularly when they're taken for long periods of time. The, the idea that they might accidentally happen to target the underlying biological abnormality in depression is just pure speculation. You know, there's nothing to substantiate that idea. And the idea that you would give people potentially damaging drugs on the random chance that you might hit the target seems absolutely astonishing to me that anyone could think that that was a reasonable justification for using a drug. Hello, my name is Beata Pawlikowska. I'm a journalist, a writer and a traveler from Poland. For a few years now, I've been interested in science, especially neurobiology and microbiome. And this is how I came up with the idea of my own podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Joanna Moncrief from University College London, a psychiatrist. So we will talk about psychiatric drugs and mental health problems. And what Dr. Joanna Moncrief has to say about antidepressants may come as a surprise to you. Turns out that we don't know what causes mental problems of whatever kind. We don't know how antidepressants actually work and what kind of changes they induce in the brain and in the whole body. It was very inspiring and very informative. Here's my conversation with Dr. Joanna Moncrief. Dr. Joanna Moncrief is a psychiatrist and a professor at University College London and one of the founders of the Critical Psychiatry Network. What is the network? Why is it? What is the critical of? We will explain today. But let's start in 1989 when you qualified from the university in Newcastle upon Tyne. And it was a very interesting time because there was a time that the first SSRIs and antidepressants were introduced and they were marketed as miracle drugs and everybody was delighted. Were you delighted with that too? Were you excited about them? So I have to confess that I've always been skeptical about antidepressants and always had a, a rather different view about, about the drugs that we, we prescribe for mental health problems. So I was not convinced by all the hype that surrounded them. I was also very concerned about some of the publicity campaigns, um, some of which were run by medical organisations like the Defeat Depression campaign that was run in the United Kingdom. And these campaigns set out to persuade people that taking a drug to deal with your emotional problems was uh, an acceptable and indeed a, a um, beneficial and recommended thing to do. And they set out to reassure people wrongly, as we now know, that antidepressants were not addictive, that they didn't um, make people physically dependent or cause withdrawal syndromes. So I was, yeah, in my first years as, as a very junior psychiatrist, that campaign was going on while SSRIs were uh, being marketed and, and um, uh, coming into, into use. And so I watched, I watched uh, the beginnings of this huge escalation that we have seen in the um, uh, prevalence of mental health problems, particularly depression over the last few decades. And I could see how it was being driven by marketing, by the pharmaceutical industry, but also how medical institutions were oiling the wheels, helping that along. And I remember that there were voices already back in 1987. David Healy was writing about it not being the miracle drug. So not everybody was in, in the um, uh, appraisal mode of the antidepressants. And there were psychiatrists that knew it's not the, the only answer to mental health problems. So, so David Healy wrote 
an article about the serotonin hypothesis of depression back in 1987, saying then that there the was no evidence for it. This whole idea that antidepressants worked by reversing brain chemical abnormalities had never been um, evidenced and you know, was really a, a, a failed and out, outdated paradigm that needed to be abandoned just before it was sort of massively renewed and, and uh, reinvigorated and, and pushed out to market these new drugs. Uh, and, and, and he, um, he pointed out in, in that article that there'd been a big um, NIH funded project that had happened in the United States, that is, it was funded by the National Institute of Health, their big state funding organization that had looked into whether there were any chemical abnormalities in the brains of people with depression in the 1980s, and they had not found any evidence of that. It, it wasn't really very clearly reported, but that's what they had set out to do, and they never reported that they found it. So it's funny that it took us uh, more than 25 years to arrive to the study published in Molecular Psychiatry last year in July, analyzing all the evidence existing about the chemical imbalance theory and concluding that there is none. Yes. You were one of the authors of the study. I was, I was. So, so, so our study that was published in 2022 basically came to the same conclusion that David Healy had come to in 1987. We had a lot of um, research to look at that had been done since that time, that had been done during the 1990s and, and in this century. Uh, and we looked at the research on, all, all the research on different aspects of serotonin function that has been thought to support the serotonin theory of depression. Uh, that has been, you know, cited as supporting it in various different publications. And we got all that together and found that not one of those areas showed convincing evidence that there was an abnormality of serotonin in people who were depressed. OK, um, we as the general public, people who are not psychiatrists, we do not know how the psychiatry work, how psychiatrists solve mental health problems. And we believe what we are being told, especially if everybody says the same thing, like depression is caused by the chemical imbalance in the brain of, or lack of serotonin. But so we don't even have a clue that there may be other theories and other possibilities. And this, chemical imbalance of the brain cause of, of depression is not the only way of looking at it. So what is the biomedical model of looking at depression? The, the, the one, yeah. Yeah, so the main model for understanding depression and for understanding the action of antidepressants is the idea, and I stress this is an idea, it's a theory, it's not something that's been substantiated, that depression is caused by some sort of physical abnormality in the brain, whether that's an abnormality of brain chemicals or nervous structure and connections or nerve cell growth. There are various different, different uh, versions of this theory. But basically the idea is depression is caused by some sort of brain abnormality and this can be rectified by the right sort of physical treatment, usually a drug that's going to tweak the brain's chemistry in some way or stimulate nerve cells in, in order to reverse the underlying abnormality. So that's the, that, that's the view that most doctors hold, most doctors believe, and have been passing on to, the, uh, to, the, to their patients for the last few decades. And the, the particular version of that theory that has, um, you know, that, that has been most commonly held is this idea that depression is caused by abnormalities in specific brain chemicals and that these abnormalities can be corrected by drugs, by antidepressants. Um, and serotonin has been one of the main candidates. And 
this theory has been put across um, most strongly by the manufacturers of these drugs in order to, to sell their products. But as you said, as you completely rightly said, there are other ways of understanding what depression is and of understanding what drugs might do to someone who is depressed. Um, so I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. But before I do, I should say that um, th 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 this, uh, this biomedical idea of depression and, and what drug treatment is doing has been so dominant that I think it's been it's been very difficult for patients to or patients have basically not been exposed to these other ideas about how antidepressants might work and what depression might be. And that's why our paper, when it was released in, in July 2022, um, provoked so much attention and was so shocking to so many people because they just had never, it had never been um, proposed to them, it had never been put to them by anyone that actually there might be another way of understanding this situation, their situation. So the, so the biomedical way of understanding depression suggests that it's a disease of the brain. One of the possible diseases, like physiological diseases, like we have diabetes or we have uh, inflammation of the lungs, it's a disease of the brain. Yeah. And yes. So, so, so yes, um, of course, ev every psychiatrist will acknowledge that it's not that brain, what happens in the brain is not the only relevant factor and that other things are relevant to depression, such as life circumstances, previous history of trauma and things like that. No one is denying those things, but they are saying that the brain component, there is a component of the um, of the causation of depression that is down to things going on in the brain, and what I would what I would add to that is that or say to that is that once you say there's something going wrong in the brain, you are as you say equating this situation with a disease of the body, like you know lung cancer or pneumonia um, or liver disease, and uh, and and. In those cases, um, and, 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 and in all these cases, th there, is, there is something going wrong in, in a part of the body. And if you don't put that right, then there's no point really doing anything else. So, so when you propose that something in the body or the brain is the cause of a condition, you necessarily make the biological component of the condition the most important. And you also make it impossible to deal with it on your own. You have to go and see a doctor and the doctor has to give you a pill for that. Absolutely. It then becomes a specialist medical activity. Managing that condition becomes a specialist medical activity. Um, something that you as, a, as an ordinary person are at best going to be, you know, you might be able to sort of tweak it around the edges, but you're not going to be able to really, you know, address this problem satisfactorily. Yeah, we, we cannot heal a disease of, a heart, of, of the heart of, or our kidneys. So how could we possibly heal a disease of the brain? Yes. So yeah. we need help with that and we need a, a pill for that. There yes. must be a pill for everything. You need you need some sort of intervention that is going to work on the brain. Yes, whether it's okay. a pill or it might be might be you know elect electrical treatment ECT, but yeah, something yeah. that's going to change the state of the brain. So before we talk about the SSRIs, let's talk about other ways of seeing depression or possible reasons for depression, except for this biological model. Yeah. So, so maybe I could talk about drug effects first, because then I, I think it sort of then leads okay. into other ways of understanding depression and other emotional problems. So, so the way that we used to think about um, the use of drugs for mental health problems um, was the way that we might think about the use of alcohol or drugs like benzodiazepines nowadays. So we recognize that these drugs alter your state of mind, put you into a different state of consciousness. 
and that that might temporarily obscure or replace your underlying feelings. So in English, I don't know if it's the same in Polish, but in English, we have an expression um, about using alcohol to drown your sorrows, um, which recognizes that the effects of alcohol can yeah. eliminate your sorrows temporarily. Um, now, that way of thinking about drugs was became very prevalent in the 1980s when it became apparent that lots and lots of people had been prescribed benzodiazepine drugs um, for anxiety or nervousness or a whole range of, of, um, of problems and had become um, physically dependent on them. And this was, this was very problematic and a lot of people were having difficulty getting off them and some people had permanent symptoms or long lasting symptoms after they came off them. And it also became apparent that these drugs had been prescribed um, with very carelessly for, you know, a whole range of problems um, uh, that, you know, that, that really should have been dealt with, of per people's personal and social problems that should have been dealt with in a different way. We've forgotten that way of thinking about drug treatment, but antidepressants, although they're not the same as benzodiazepines, they're a different sort of drug, but nevertheless, they do affect, they do change the brain, they change the normal state of the brain, and therefore they change people's normal mental activity, including their feelings and, and sensations. And those effects, just like the benzodiazepine effects or the effects of alcohol, are temporarily superimposed onto someone's underlying feelings. Now, the effects of antidepressants are in general more subtle than the effects of benzodiazepines than alcohol, although they vary considerably. Um, but they do seem to have the property of inducing emotional numbing or reducing the intensity of emotions, both good and positive emotions and bad emotions. And therefore, when you superimpose that state onto, onto a state of depression, you can see that someone would, you know, their, the intensity of their depression would lessen. Um, so that is what I think is happening when people take antidepressants for depression, that the, the antidepressants induce a slightly different state of mind, which basically obscures people obscures the underlying feelings or distracts people from their feelings temporarily because there's, there's a, a very large placebo effect as well that is operating um, in depression, which we know is well documented from trials. Um, so, so that's what I think is happening when people use antidepressants for depression. And, and, and that is a different way of thinking about, uh, sorry, sorry yeah, that is a different way of thinking about um, what drugs do from the way that we have been coached into thinking about them um, since the 1990s by the pharmaceutical industry, which is this idea that they are rectifying some sort of underlying abnormality. And so this just highlights, I think, that prior to this, this um, publicity drive by the pharmaceutical industry in the 1990s, people understood, people were hesitant about using drugs to manage emotional problems. And they understood that drugs change your normal state of mind and don't, put any, don't resolve anything. So I think going back to that time, people had an idea that emotional problems were, and, and we know this in fact from surveys, surveys that were done to try and work out how to change people's minds. We know from those surveys that people thought that depression was an emotional reaction to things that were going on in someone's life, particularly things like unemployment or divorce um, or housing difficulties. Uh, and, and that they are likely to be influenced by what has happened in someone's past as well. Mm -hmm. And again, we know um, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, if you've had a, a, a difficult childhood and been subject to abuse or trauma um, as a child, you are more vulnerable to getting depression later in life. So I think the other, the alternative way of understanding depression is as an emotional reaction to our past and present circumstances. 
And that, so, and, and that gives you a different idea for how you, you know, how you can help yourself and how you can help other people. You know, it, it, would, it makes no sense to be tweaking the brain. You need to change what it is that's going on around you uh, in, order to, in order to feel better, in order to improve your mood. What you say seems to me that depression is a part of life. Depression is suffering and su suffering as any pain in the, in, felt in the body shows that something is wrong and something needs action and healing. So would you say that depression is a pain of the soul or pain of the mind, not of the brain, but of the um, mental state of, of yeah. Yeah. I don't know, of the soul? Absolutely, absolutely. Depression is like... It, it's like a barometer it's something that indicates that everything is not right within your life that something is going wrong and i would say that this is the case all, all our emotions are reactions to the things going on around us and they are our emotion our, our capacity for emotions is part of part of our intelligence it's part of what it is to be an intelligent being that an intelligent being reacts to its environment um, and evaluates different things as being good or bad for its interests and for its its desires and its aims and its goals um, and depression happens when um, you know often often when there is loss when you lose something that was important in your life that you valued, that gave you pleasure and happiness, um, like a, a partner or, or a job. Um, and, and, and it also happens when other things <clears throat> in your life happen that, uh, you know, that, 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 um, that, that conflict with your, your aims and your goals and your values. So it's the result of conditions where you feel no hope, where you feel helpless, where you feel bad, you are stuck in a place and depression is telling you this is a wrong place in your life. You need to do something to change your life conditions and then your mood and your well-being will uh, become better. Yeah. So so I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we all we're, we're all different and some people are more more sensitive to intense emotional states than others. So, you know, depression can be really serious and really difficult for some people to get over and get out of. Um, so so what I'm saying doesn't doesn't contradict that fact at all. It is certainly true that some people can become very, you know, seriously depressed and really struggle to lift themselves out of it and do what needs to be done to, to make the changes that, that, um, uh, that, 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 that the depression is sort of demanding them to make. Um, and, um, and, 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 and it may be difficult sometimes for people to identify why they are depressed you know what 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 is going wrong what is it it's not not always easy for people to really <clears throat> really pinpoint what the problem is um and th and that's you know and, and that's how we can help people with depression i think you know we can support people to try and work out what they're responding to, what, what their depression is a response to, and then how they can try and change it. And there is also space for antidepressants. If, as you said, there are substances that change the state of the brain, there are psychoactive substances like alcohol, then taking them in small amount for a short period of time may help you lift from the state of helplessness where you're not able to do anything or think clearly? Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you about that because I don't think that antidepressants do lift people. They, they numb people. And 
some people might decide that being numbed is better than not being numbed, is better than experiencing the emotion. But I'm not sure. I, I think there are other people who would not want that. And I'm, I'm not sure that really it is better to be numbed because sometimes we need to feel the emotion in order to get past it and also in order to learn how to manage it. Um, and, and being numbed might mean that actually we don't address what we need to address. Um, I'm not against the use of drugs at all. You know, I, um, I think there's a place for some short term sedative medication if people are really struggling to sleep or if they're very anxious and agitated. Um, but I, I'm not sure that antidepressants really have much of a role uh, and, and I also really worry about the, the message that, that they are giving to people, um, you know, that, that, that there's this chemical that can lift you up, because I just don't think that is actually, actually true. So I recorded a video about uh, depression and uh, the history of antidepressants. And one of the most controversial things I said was that the science shows that antidepressants do not cure depression because this is how they're marketed in Poland that they cure depression that they are a cure for a disease we call depression so it means that if you take antidepressants you will be cured of depression is there any science to back this statement so I, I called my first book the myth of the chemical cure because I believe that that idea is a myth and that there is no science to back it up at all. Um, so the importance of our serotonin paper was the serotonin theory of depression is one of the main theories, um, the, the main ideas about what the biological basis of depression might be. It has been very heavily researched for 70 years now, people have been looking into the role of, of serotonin in depression. And after all that time, there is no evidence that serotonin is linked with depression. So there are lots of other theories out there about what the biological basis of depression might be, but they have not been proved either. Therefore, we don't know what the biological basis is. We don't know, therefore, that we have drugs that are that are targeting that biological basis, uh, and therefore we cannot say that we are curing depression. To In your fact, knowledge, we should, yeah. you know, that this should make us, you know, we don't know what the abnormality is, and yet we are using drugs that we know do change the state of the brain. In fact, these drugs change the normal state of the brain, and, and that should worry us about what these drugs might do to people, particularly when they're taken for long periods of time. Two questions. Is there any drug, to your knowledge, and you're a psychiatrist with clinical practice, is there any drug that cures depression? No. There's, there's no drug that cures depression, and we don't know what depression is. In, we, we have no idea whether there is any brain state that corresponds to depression. I once heard a psychiatrist say that the mechanism of action of antidepressants is drowning the brain in chemicals, which induces certain changes, but we don't know what kind of changes or where exactly in the brain. So by accident, we trigger a particular response. Is this true? So when we give people drugs for depression or anything else, um, mental health drugs, they are changing this, they are changing the brain, they are affecting the brain. Um, but, uh, but, but that should worry us. The fact that we don't know um, that, that we don't know exactly how they are affecting the brain. Should, should make us worried. And the, the idea that they might accidentally happen to target the underlying biological abnormality in depression is just pure speculation. You know, there's nothing to substantiate that idea. 
And the idea that you would give people potentially damaging drugs on the random chance that you might hit the target seems absolutely astonishing to me that anyone could think that that was a reasonable justification for using a drug. The drugs were obviously um, studied short term before being prescribed to patients, but they were never tested long term, were they? No. So, so I, I think it's important to talk about the testing because since our serotonin paper in particular, people have been saying, well, the use of antidepressants is not based on um, their mechanism of action. And people have said, yes, we, you know, we accept, we don't know exactly what they're doing, but we know that they work. Now, when people say that, what they are referring to are mostly short-term studies, tr clinical trials that compare an antidepressant with a placebo tablet and show a very small difference in improvement levels between the two. The vast majority of improvement happens in people taking placebo as well as people taking the antidepressant. And if you take all the studies together, the, the improvement in people on antidepressants is a little bit better. The difference is so small, it probably doesn't, it's probably clinically irrelevant. It probably doesn't really make any difference to anyone. The various attempts that people have made to work out what difference would be clinically meaningful all come up way above the level of difference between the antidepressant and placebo that, that comes across in, in those trials. And the other point, as you said, the other important point is that those trials are mostly very short term, looking at people who've taken an antidepressant for usually around about eight weeks, sometimes as long as 12 weeks, but rarely longer than that. And of course, we know that many people um, go on to take antidepressants uh, for months and years. Um, but, but also, I, I'd like to say that that very small difference between antidepressants and placebo is not necessarily a pharmacological difference. Um, it may well be a part of the placebo effect, what we might call an amplified placebo effect, because people who are taking the active drugs, the active antidepressants in these trials, are often able to identify that they have got the active drug rather than the placebo because they experience some side effects such as a dry mouth or a bit of nausea um, or because they feel a bit different um, because the, these drugs are drugs that act on the brain as, as I've been saying. And we know that what people think they are taking has a strong impact on their outcome. Uh, so studies have, have shown that very clearly, that people who guess they're on an antidepressant, regardless of whether they're on it or not, do much pe better than people who guess they're not on an antidepressant. So it's very possible, to my mind, that this small difference that we see between antidepressants and placebo is actually just an amplified placebo response in the people who are taking the antidepressants. You mentioned the benzodiazepines prescribed in the 60s. I remember you used the expression willy-nilly yes. prescribed to everyone. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it seems that now what we are beginning to understand about the antidepressants is quite similar to what we discovered about benzodiazepines because when they were being prescribed, nobody knew they were addictive and that they may have harmful long-term effects. And this is what now we're discovering about the antidepressants. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, absolutely. So, so the benzodiazepine drugs were introduced in the 1960s as a non-addictive alternative to barbiturates, which were the most commonly used type of drug for mental health problems at that time. And it was becoming apparent then that barbiturates were uh, very addictive and very dangerous. And so people were moved on to benzodiazepines and told that these were much safer and non-addictive. It became apparent by the late 70s and certainly by the 1980s that this was not true and that benzodiazepines were indeed addictive. Um, they weren't ever quite as dangerous in the sense of being toxic as the barbiturates, but they were certainly addictive. And... Um, 
Uh, and the other thing that was noted back in the 80s was that some people had real trouble getting off these, these tablets and sometimes had persistent symptoms, even after they'd stopped them for quite a long time, persistent symptoms indicating some neurological effects because often these symptoms included anxiety, but also tinnitus ringing in the ears and restless legs and twitching and things like that. So it looks like the story has been repeated yet again with antidepressants, which again were marketed uh, and widely um, endorsed by medical organizations as not being addictive. And now it turns out that actually people uh, do become physically dependent on them. Um, th there is a slight difference in, in the sense that antidepressants don't make you high. They're not pleasant to take in the way that, and that benzodiazepines are for some people. Um, so benzodiazepines have crossed over into the recreational drug scene in a way that antidepressants haven't because they're just not that, not that pleasant. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't cause a physical withdrawal syndrome, which has now been recognized and uh, similar to the benzodiazepines, they can be very difficult to withdraw from and the withdrawal symptoms can last a long time. So that's the difference between addiction and physical dependence. And in Poland, it's being said and repeated everywhere that antidepressants are not addictive. But nobody says they're not addictive, but they do cause physical dependence. Yes. Can you explain what physical dependence is? So physical dependence is when the body gets used to a drug. And so when you take the drug away, the adaptations that the body has made um, are all left sort of exposed. They're not, they're not, um, they're not uh, balanced any longer by the presence of the drug. And that's what produces withdrawal symptoms. And often they are sort of opposite to the effects of the drug. So if you have a drug that's sedating and makes you go to sleep, the withdrawal symptoms will be that you can't sleep. Um, but th th that's not always not always the case. And sometimes withdrawal symptoms are um, quite sort of unique and unpredictable. Um, so it, it's undoubtedly the case that antidepressants cause these physical withdrawal symptoms. The addiction is sometimes used in a specialist way as meaning um, as meaning a state in which people crave a drug and enjoy a drug and, and, and seek the drug, drugs and therefore engage in drug seeking behavior as it's sometimes called. But I think what's confusing is that to the general public, addiction and, depend and physical dependence mean the same thing. And most people understand something being addictive as meaning that it will produce a physical withdrawal syndrome. And it's something that, that you cannot live without. Uh, exactly, that you can't get off because it's difficult to get off. So, so to that extent, I would say that antidepressants are addictive. And at, at very least, I think putting out this message that they are not addictive without explaining that they do cause a physical dependence syndrome is very misleading. So what kind of changes do antidepressants do in the body or and in the brain? So the short answer is we don't know. In the, uh, in the short term, they, they are designed to increase the levels of serotonin in the nerve synapses. In, in, that's the gaps between two nerves. Uh, and that, in theory, makes the messages that those nerves transmit um, happen more, more quickly and more efficiently. Um, we, we really don't know what serotonin's function in the body is, though. We don't know very much about it. Probably the most convincing research is that it is involved in sexual function in some way, uh, and it's involved in inhibiting sexual function. So, so activating and increasing the effects of serotonin generally inhibit your uh, ability to experience sexual pleasure and have sexual feelings. Um, other than that, we're, serotonin is probably involved in, in most 
bodily functions and, and probably many mental functions too, but we really don't know very much and haven't been able to um, distinguish its role from the role of all the other uh, chemicals that, that exist in the brain. Does it mean that if the drug changes the amount of serotonin in the brain and in the body, there is a lot of serotonin in the gut as well, then it produces changes everywhere in the body where serotonin is. So, so yes. It might affect every, yes. every organ yes. in the body, Absolutely. including the brain. Yes. So you would expect a drug to affect all, all, all the areas where there is serotonin. And, and these drugs probably affect other systems as well, although they're designed, or many of them were designed to target serotonin. They probably, not, nothing is sort of purely targets one system or another. And then the other important thing to say is that although they're designed to increase serotonin in the short term, in the long term, there's some indications that they might actually be reducing our serotonin levels. Um, so, so the studies of blood plasma, but also studies of the uh, serotonin metabolite seem to indicate that people who've been using antidepressants for long periods actually have lower levels of serotonin than people who are not, have not been using them. Does it mean that antidepressants may induce depression? Well, we can't say that because, as I say, we don't know that depression is linked with serotonin. Um, Uh, but I think there are psychological reasons why long-term use of antidepressants may make people more vulnerable to depression. <clears throat> and that's because if people think that uh, they got better because of an antidepressant and think they can't get off it and they need it, uh, they're probably going to be more vulnerable to stresses going on in their lives, and they may not have developed the sort of self-management skills that would enable them to, uh, to get through a difficult period. So I think there are psychological reasons why long-term antidepressants might make people vulnerable to depression. Um, they might do things to the brain that make people vulnerable as well, but we don't know what they are. Let me, let me reformulate my question. <laughs> may Is it possible that antidepressants may induce dysphoria? Well, again, I, again, I think it's difficult to say at a chemical basis because we don't know what the chemical basis of dysphoria is. Um, they, I, I mean, they, they produce this state of emotional numbing. They produce lethargy, um, uh, tiredness, fatigue, weight gain. So there are all sorts of ways in which they, um, which they affect people that may lead to dysphoria. And they may lead to dysphoria. We've just not studied this very closely at all. We just have not paid attention to the ways in which antidepressants alter people's mental states in the short term or in the long term. I mean, it's almost impossible to find a study that actually looks at, at, at that question, which is unbelievable. We've been given people mind-altering drugs for decades and decades without ever bothering to work out how they change people's minds, how they change our mental states, our mental activities, our moods, our cognitive abilities. But the most amazing thing that you seem to be saying is that antidepressants numb emotions and change people's ability to deal with life because if you feel less you have less motivation and you're less likely to take any action to improve your life so taking antidepressants might make it less possible for you to fix whatever is wrong with your life which was the initial cause of depression I, I think that's right I mean I don't think we can be certain about that but I think that's right and Is, is a possibility. And there are some long-term studies that seem to suggest that people with depression who take antidepressants have a worse outcome than people who don't take antidepressants. That may be due to other things. They may have had more severe depression in the first place or have more, you know, more, more difficult life histories. But nevertheless, it does suggest that it's a possibility that taking antidepressants actually makes your outcome worse. A friend of mine has been taking antidepressants for 20 years 
And the psychiatrist prescribing the drug said, you may never stop because if you stop and your symptoms of depression come back, if you start taking the drugs again, they will not work. Is this true? We don't know that. Uh, but as I say, I'm, I'm not convinced that antidepressants work anyway. So it work in the first place. So I wouldn't expect them to work second time round either. Uh, the, and another point to make about that, of course, is when people stop antidepressants, they do often feel bad. And uh, many people assume that they're having a relapse. But of course, of course, a lot of that may be down to withdrawal symptoms, withdrawal symptoms, making people feel um, emotional fragility is an important part of, of withdrawal because these drugs numb emotions when you're taking them. When you take them away, people often get a sort of rebound of emotions and feel emotionally um, you know, fragile, very tearful, um, uh, yeah, very sort of much more emotionally responsive than they, you know, than they felt for a long time. Um, so, and, and people might interpret that as having a relapse of their underlying problem when actually it's, it's a withdrawal syndrome. And it may be used as an argument saying you were taking antidepressants, you were feeling good, you stopped taking them and your depression is back. So you have to go on taking them. So um, what are, how do, how do we recognize the withdrawal symptoms? How do we differentiate them um, from the relapse of depression? Yeah. So I think it is complicated. And one of the ways that you differentiate them is that they go away. They usually go away um, uh, after, you know, after, a few weeks. Um, another way is that they may be associated with physical symptoms that you haven't had before, or that you're having, you know, that are much worse than before, like dizziness. That's a common complication of of antidepressant withdrawal. Um, or uh, sometimes um, people get these electric zap feelings in their heads. They that also occurred with benzodiazepine drugs, um, uh, with, with withdrawal from benzodiazepines. Um, so, so, so accompanying physical symptoms and just the pattern that they come on very soon after you've stopped taking the medication. Well, depending on the half-life, it might be a bit later with other drugs. And sometimes there might be a delayed withdrawal reaction for some, for some drugs. So it, it is all quite complicated. Um, and the other thing, just to respond to what you were saying then, it, when people are told, you know, that, they've, that they need their antidepressant and they mustn't stop, then people people are very fearful about stopping and find it very difficult and are very anxious and you know potentially interpret sort of catastrophize everything that that happens um, after they stop their, their medication and, uh, and, um, and and may think that they're becoming depressed even if they're not or indeed may become so anxious and feel so vulnerable that they do become depressed. The withdrawal symptoms may be very serious and it may take a very long time actually to withdraw from antidepressants. How should we do it in the right way? You can never just yeah. stop taking them, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. No, that, that's very important. It's, it, it's become increasingly apparent that it can be really difficult for some people to withdraw from these drugs and um, so some people will need to take a very long time and do it very, very slowly. What I would suggest is that everyone starts with, if, if they want to withdraw, make sure that you know, you're in a good situation in life and then just make a small reduction and test yourself and see how that goes um, and, and continue with small reductions. But as you get down to lower doses, you should make the reductions um, smaller. Even smaller. Yeah, um, because it, it seems to be, uh, well, we, we know that lower doses have a proportionately greater effect on the body because they're, they're um, uh, because of, of, of the way that drugs are, are metabolized and made available in the body. Um, so, so it's important to do that last bit when you get down to lower doses very slowly and gradually. You say very slowly, but what does it mean in practice? 
how long may it take to, to, to come off antidepressants? So, so, so it, it really just um, it depends a lot on the individual, but for some people, it will be very slowly. So some people um, will have to uh, we'll have to use liquids and measure out tiny, tiny amounts. Some people um, who are taking drugs where there's not a liquid easily available um, have uh, done things like broken open capsules and counted out the tiny balls within the capsules and, and you know, just gradually decreased by, by taking fewer and fewer of these, these balls. So, you know, very difficult thing to do. Or, or sometimes people weigh tablets and, you know, cut them up and, and, and weigh them. Um, and and this process may go on for years, it may take some people years to, to get off, but, but it does vary a lot. Some people have, have less trouble, probably people who've been on them for a shorter period of time, and they can come off a little bit quicker. All right. As I said, you're a psychiatrist and you have your own patients. How do you help people with mental health problems or people with depression? What do you say? Where do you start? So I try and help them to identify why they are depressed, the reasons for their depression. That's always got to be the first thing. And what can be done about those reasons? What can people adjust? What can people do? Is that some uh, marital therapy to help with a relationship or is it um, support in their in their work or is it finding social activities to address loneliness and isolation um, so it, always those are the main things and sometimes therapy I think can be helpful I don't think therapy is necessary for everyone um, but I think therapy can be very helpful for people who are struggling to identify exactly what it is um, that, that is making them depressed and therapy can also be helpful for people um, to learn how to manage emotions particularly if they've maybe been on drugs in the past and haven't haven't learned other ways of of, of managing their emotions um, and 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 I, I I mean I do personally offer antidepressants to people because I feel that I would probably be being negligent if I didn't. That's what most people most people get. But I explain my view my views as well as the standard view on what antidepressants are doing, and and then ask people. You know, then it's it's down to people to make their own choice about whether they feel the effects, the the, the alterations produced by antidepressants, as far as we know about them, would be helpful to them or not. But I think one of the main things that needs to be done is really to demedicalize depression and take it out of medicine so that people don't start to have the expectation that there is a medical intervention that can put things right in the first place. And I think so maybe, you know, more investing more in social services so that there's more social support for people um, would, you know, would be a, really an alternative way of managing the problems that, that we're managing in a medical way now. So the critical psychiatry network is critical of overusing of medication. Is this right? So, so the critical psychiatry network is a group of psychiatrists who, um, we, we, you know, we, we have a very broad range of views, but many of us are sceptical to various degrees about the biomedical um, story of mental health problems, about the idea that mental health problems are brain diseases, you know, that can be understood in the same way as you would understand pneumonia or something like that. Uh, and, and then allied with that view, most people would also think that, yes, that we are overusing medication for these sorts of problems and that we should be looking at alternative ways of supporting people. Do you consider depression a disease or a state of mind? So I personally think it's very unhelpful to think of depression as a disease. And we need to see it as a, as a state of mind, as as I said, as, as a sort of emotional response to our circumstances. So let's imagine that someone being in a depressed state of mind is watching us now. Could you 
say a word of hope to people who are depressed and listening to our conversation. So I suppose it's a word of hope, but it's also it's also sometimes a difficult message. But but the message is that you you can you can get through this. People people recover from depression in general. Almost everyone recovers from depression, um, and and it, there are things that you can do to help yourself on that journey. Um, trying to identify why you're depressed is the main thing, um, and then trying to uh, address the causes, but also to some extent trying to manage your emotions so that you can get through a difficult period uh, and come out the other end. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beata. <laughs>